Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. In our first two shows, we've examined some of the key statements made by the McCanns and their friends about what they insist was the abduction of Madeleine. We saw how there were numerous changes of story and outright contradictions. And we saw how the stories surrounding what was supposed to be the last time Madeleine was seen by anyone other than the McCanns, namely their close friend David Payne, was riddled with a series of clear contradictions. The accounts of this supposed visit, when Dr. Payne claimed to have seen all three children dressed in white pyjamas and looking angelic, were so at odds with each other that anyone would have had good reason to doubt whether this visit ever took place at all. We referred to the report of Police Inspector Tavares de Almedia, who at the time the McCanns were pulled in for questioning, filed a detailed report giving numerous reasons why the police were sure that Madeline had died in the McCanns' apartment and that therefore they must have hidden her body. And then finally, we examined the convincing evidence provided by one of the world's top dog handlers, Martin Grime, and his two cadaver dogs, Eddie and Keeler, who alerted to the scent of a corpse in eleven places and to blood at some of those locations. We then saw how the McCanns struggled in all sorts of convoluted ways to try and explain why the dogs alerted to the smell of human cadaver and blood. Now it's time to throw light on a matter that's never been covered before on any film, TV documentary or YouTube video, nor in any newspaper articles, for the simple reason that this subject is too hot for others to handle. For the first time on film, we're going to take you right behind the scenes and expose what has really gone on in the private investigations mounted by the McCanns. You'll be able to judge for yourselves whether this much trumpeted and expensive private investigation was ever about a wholehearted search for Madeleine or whether this operation might have had a wholly different purpose. But before we go to the extraordinary details of what the McCann's private investigators were really doing, how was it all funded? Most of it, from what we have been told, was in fact funded by you, the great British public. Just 13 days after Madeleine was reported missing, and at a time when she could have been found at any time, the McCanns launched a fund, which was officially called Madeleine's Fund, leaving no stone unturned. Let's now take a little look at how and why this fund was set up in the first place. Exactly when it was that the McCanns thought of setting up a fund to find Madeleine is not really certain. In her book, Madeleine, Kate McCann explains it like this. On page 120, she says, Jerry had set himself the challenge to leave no stone unturned. There were so many people who desperately wanted to help. Jerry's call to arms spurred them into action. Then she says, Jerry McCann's sister, teacher Philomena McCann, sent a chain mail around the world asking every recipient to help find our little girl, followed by her claim that this led to a first conversation between Philomena and Callum McRae, a former pupil of hers and an IT whiz kid, about establishing a website for Madeline. Four pages on in her book, Kate introduces the shadowy group called the International Family Law Group. They appeared to consist of just a barrister who didn't give his name to the McCanns and a paralegal. Later, a third shadowy figure joined them from an organisation called Control Risks Group, who said, Just call me Hugh. The barrister had apparently offered the McCann's help immediately he heard the news about Madeline going missing. It was on Friday the 11th of May, barely a week after Madeline had been reported missing, that these two men of mystery, the barrister and the paralegal, flew out to Praia de Luz. 
No one knows who paid for this visit, so we are invited by the McCanns to believe that this was the selfless act of a good Samaritan. However, on page 125, Kate McCann does tell us a little more about this third figure. It transpired that he was a former intelligence officer, now a kidnap negotiator and counsellor. She then explains why the fund for Madeline was set up. We had discussed the offers of help that were pouring in, including many financial pledges. One of Jerry's colleagues said his staff want to make a donation, but didn't know how or where to deposit it. The IFLG told us we needed to set up a fighting fund. They would devise the objectives of the fund and instruct a leading charity law firm, Bates, Wells and Braithwaite, to draw up articles of association. According to this account then, this fund for Madeline was all somebody else's idea and recommendation. And so it was that just days later, the organisation Madeline's Fund, leaving no stone unturned, was founded, and the McCanns began collecting what turned out to be millions of pounds, donated mostly by the ever-willing and generous great British public. In a moment we are going to examine how all that money has been spent, or perhaps, as I'll show, frittered away. It's important to emphasise that Madeline's Fund is not a charity, although many people think that it is. It is in fact a private company, set up as a trust. And importantly, it is controlled by the McCanns and members of their family. The current directors of Madeline's Fund are Jerry McCann, Kate McCann, Brian Kennedy, uncle of Kate McCann, Edward Smethurst, the McCann's coordinating lawyer and a top Freemason, John Corner, close family friend of the McCann's and Madeline's godfather, and Michael Linnett, family friend and accountant, member of a secret of Catholic Masonic Society, the Catenians. What was the original purpose of this fund, though? The honest answer is that it was intended to be a fighting fund to meet legal expenses. In other words, from the get-go it was intended to provide funds for the defence of the McCanns. Just ten days after Madeline had been allegedly abducted, and could still have been found alive, why would the McCanns be thinking of needing a legal fighting fund? It was a relative of theirs in the same village, Kate McCann's uncle, Brian Kennedy, who gave the game away in a TV interview in the village. But I'm joined now by Madeline's great uncle, Brian Kennedy, and he's going to tell us about the fighting fund. Um, what's been the public's response to it, Brian? Well, it's been very good so far, but a lot of people have said they're not quite sure how they can give money, so may I tell them? Yes, very briefly. Right, yes. very briefly. You can go into any branch of the NatWest or the Royal Bank of Scotland and just say that you would like to make a contribution to the Madeline Fund. But tell me, Brian, about all the people that have been coming up to you today, just literally stuffing money in your hand. Yes, they have. It's, it's very touching, very touching. I, I, I would just say this is not an appeal. The family haven't made an appeal. We've just set up a mechanism for people who said they wanted to do something and contribute so that the money can be used uh, for all sorts of reasons, but probably mainly for legal expenditure. That was an honest answer. The McCanns already knew, or sensed, that they would be needing top-line solicitors and barristers. And indeed, over the past seven years, the McCanns have had legal help worth an estimated £4 million or more. Here's a list. They have spent five years trying to claim £1 million damages from Dr. Conchalo Amaral, the coordinator of the initial investigation into Madeline's disappearance and attempting to ban his book, The Truth About a Lie. They spent nearly £400,000 silencing retired solicitor Tony Bennett with a libel action after he wrote two books on the case. And they've spent a small fortune on legal advice from a series of top solicitors and barristers who have advised them in relation to their having formally been declared suspects in the disappearance of their own daughter and the risks of being extradited to Portugal to face charges. But very soon the message was changed. The fund was not to be used for legal expenses, apparently. Instead it was to be used to find Madeline and they launched a major Look for Madeline campaign. How much the McCanns have raised in the way of donations and other contributions to their fund is shrouded in mystery. Equally unclear is exactly how all the money has been spent. Although the Madeleine's fund directors have produced annual reports, as required by company law, these are very opaque. Dublin-based accountant Enid O'Dowd has written a major analysis of the fund, titled Madeleine's Fund, Review and Investigation of Accounts. Enid O'Dowd's report shows that the company only complies to the bare minimum with legal requirements and does not show a detailed breakdown of where the income has come from and on what it's been spent. 
and this despite the McCann's claim that they wanted their fund to be transparent. But we don't have time to dwell on the operation of the fund. What we do know is that a significant portion of the fund has been spent on a series of detective agencies and investigators. I'm now going to put them under the microscope. But first let me explain how the McCann's private investigation operation has been directed and by whom. The first thing to say is that the McCanns have always maintained that decisions about the private investigation have been made by the directors of Madeline's Fund, whose names I have mentioned. But the real controller of the McCanns' private investigation all along has been a Cheshire businessman by the name of Brian Kennedy. This is not Kate's uncle, Brian Kennedy, who lives in Rothley. This Brian Kennedy is a major multimillionaire businessman. He lives in a palatial mansion in the Cheshire countryside. He has a large business empire which includes his Latium Group based in Wilmslow, Cheshire and double glazing companies such as Weatherseal. His companies have a number of times come under scrutiny for what we might call sharp business practice. Most recently this year when the now defunct Office of Fair Trading issued a damning report on Kennedy's Weatherseal company. He is perhaps most well known beyond the world of business as the chairman of successful rugby club Sale Sharks who are also based in Cheshire and for his bold but unsuccessful attempt to take over Rangers Football Club. But his venture into sport has not always been successful. Under his ownership, Cheshire-based Stockport County Football Club plummeted four divisions and out of the Football League. How did Brian Kennedy get involved in being the head of the McCann's private investigation? In her book, Kate McCann gives this account. On Wednesday the 12th of September, just three days after the McCann's had returned from Portugal, Jerry was contacted by Edward Smethurst, a commercial lawyer. He represented a businessman called Brian Kennedy, a successful entrepreneur who owned various companies, including Everest Windows. He said that Brian, like many people, had been following the unfolding drama of Madeline's disappearance. And now, seeing things going from bad to worse, he could no longer stand idly by and watch. And so it was that just two days later, a top London lawyer, Angus McBride from city firm Kingsley Napley drove all the way up from the south to Rothley to pick up the McCanns and drive them to a meeting in London where they met with Kennedy for the first time and a battery of top lawyers. The McCanns claim that it was only after this meeting that Brian Kennedy devised his campaign to run a private investigation to find Madeline. Kennedy promptly bought a house in Nutsford, again in Cheshire, as the base for his investigation. He and the McCann team have been very secretive about this base, but clips of it were shown in a Channel 4 documentary on the case shown in May 2009. Kennedy made two swift decisions. He appointed an expert in money laundering, Gary Hagland, as his British-based lieutenant, whilst at the same time making the seemingly bizarre decision to appoint a highly controversial Barcelona-based detective agency, Metodo 3, translated as the third method, to try and locate Madeline. So let's take a look at Gary Hagland and what we know about him and his work for Brian Kennedy and the McCann team. Here's a summary of what we know about his personal history. He was born in 1954 and is now 60. He appears to be unmarried. We know that he worked in a branch of the security services in the Criminal Intelligence Department of Hong Kong Royal Police from 1979 to 1985 when he appears to have returned to England and settled in a comfortable apartment in Nottingham. What he did for the next six years is a mystery, but in 1991, at the age of 37, we find him employed as an Associate Director of Compliance at accountancy firm Albert E. Sharp & Co. Compliance is an area of practice which deals with complying with ever stricter financial regulations. For him to have become a Compliance Director, Hagland would have had to have been familiar with all the up-to-date financing and banking regulations, including knowing all about the various scams and schemes associated with money laundering, a major part of the modus operandi of drug lords and other major criminals. In 1993, he published an article also covering money laundering in the Journal of Financial Regulation and Compliance, titled Effective Compliance versus Regulatory Gestation. Clearly, he was very much an acknowledged expert in money laundering by this time. During the 1990s, he suddenly becomes the director of a number of companies whose precise purpose is obscure. And then in 1999, we find an article about him in a journal called Money Laundering Bulletin. Two years later, in 2001, we find an article about him in the Financial Times Director magazine, where he is described as follows. 
Gary Hagland is a consultant with law firm Rag & Co, advising clients on the active management of compliance risks, including money laundering. Mr Hagland paints a broad picture of the type of non-financial services businesses that may well be targets for the money launderer. According to Mr Hagland, a problem for companies in complying with anti-money laundering activities is that their prevailing culture and ethos does not lend itself readily to accommodate scepticism about prospective customers. Rather, the opposite is likely to be the case. To tackle the possible threat of being unwitting accomplices to a money laundering scheme, the challenge for non-financial businesses is to change their mindset, their core attitudes. The reputational focus of most businesses is clearly not on money laundering, says Mr Hagland. The risks associated with money laundering are clear enough. Money laundering is a criminal offence. Any individual caught helping to process the proceeds of crime faces a lengthy sentence. Companies which stand accused of assisting with money laundering operations also risk substantial damage to their reputations. But how can you tell a money launderer? Money launderers are extremely well funded, well advised and make use of technically elaborate and sophisticated schemes to cover their tracks. We are left in no doubt at all. Gary Hagland is a sought after man because of his experience in one thing in particular, money laundering. So why was it that in September 2007, or maybe even before then, that Cheshire businessman Brian Kennedy hired Hagland as his right-hand man and his liaison officer with a controversial Spanish detective agency, Metodo 3? Was it because he had any sort of track record in tracing and finding missing children? Clearly not. Why hire a man who is an acknowledged expert in financial compliance to look for a missing child? Hagland was to carry on working for Brian Kennedy and the McCanns, meeting with investigators from Metodo 3, both in their Spanish headquarters in Barcelona and in Brian Kennedy's headquarters in Knutsford. It's time now then to take a very close look at this Spanish detective agency, Metodo 3. Little has been written up about them in the mainstream British press. The tabloids would merely recycle claims by the McCanns' public relations officer, Clarence Mitchell, about what a great detective agency it was explaining that the Spanish agency was carefully chosen for its reputation and its position close to Portugal. He explained that because Portugal did not allow ongoing private investigations whilst there was an official police investigation, they could not employ a Portuguese agency. The next best thing was a Spanish agency. When the broadsheet papers attempted more in-depth articles about Metodo 3, however, they were much more sceptical. A good example was one by Christine Toomey in The Times. She visited Metodo 3 in February 2008 and was seriously unimpressed by what she saw. Her article was titled, Madeleine McCann and Metodo 3, Private Eyes, Public Lies. In the autumn of 2007, Metodo boss Francisco Marco claimed that we believe she is in an area not far from the Iberian Peninsula and North Africa, adding, we have proof of her movements after her kidnap and we know she was alive the day after her disappearance. I talk of certainties because we know which group may have her or could have kidnapped her to sell her on. I cannot say who she is with because we are putting together conclusive proof that we can present to authorities. It was all utter lies. Two months before Toomey's visit, Marco had infamously made a series of boasts headlined in the British media. He first of all claimed that he knew that Madeline was alive and where she was. Then his claim that his men were closing in on the kidnappers. Finally, he boasted that Maddie will be home for Christmas. These were the most outrageous, blatant lies. Yet these lies were never condemned by the McCanns. In fact, they carried on using the services of this discredited agency for at least another 15 months until using them until at least March 2009. In her article, Christine Toomey noted that on the very day Mr Marco bragged about Madeleine McCann being Home by Christmas, Metodo 3 moved from a cramped premises above a grocer's shop specialising in sausages in Barcelona's commercial district to a multi-million pound suite of offices in a grand villa on one of the city's most prestigious boulevards.
At the time, Matodo 3 were four months into a contract with the McCanns, worth a reported £600,000 in total. How much did the McCann team pay Matodo 3 for their services? On the 29th of November 2007, Jerry McCann on his personal blog wrote that the Fine Madeline Trust was paying the £50,000 a month fees. It was then mostly the generous British public with their generous donations which was funding this detective agency. If the McCanns carried on employing them for 15 months after Francisco Marco's lying boast that Maddie will be home for Christmas, we must assume that the McCanns were very happy with their work. We will examine more of that work in a moment. Back to Christine Toomey's article in The Times. She made some acid comments on what she found in her visit. There is no discernible ringing telephones, little sign of activity of any kind, other than a woman searching for a lead to take a pet poodle for a walk and the occasional toing and froing of workmen putting finishing touches to the sleek remodelling of the office complex. Opposite the boardroom is an open plan area of around half a dozen cubicles, equipped with banks of phones and computers. Most are empty when I arrive. That tended to expose Marco's claims to have 40 people employed full-time or part-time in the search for Madeleine as false. The British press at the time, however, simply printed this unlikely claim without questioning it. Toomey went on to observe how defensive Matodo three were about their involvement in the search for Madeleine. Speaking to the boss, Francisco Marco, and his cousin, José Luis, she received this stern warning from Luis, We don't answer any questions about Maddy. Maddy is off limits. Is that understood? She continued, after talking to Marco for half an hour, I concluded that what motivates him as much as, if not more than his professed desire to present Madeline with the doll he boasts he carries around in his briefcase to hand to her when he finds her, is a sense of self-regard, self-publicity and money. She added that before its involvement in the Madeline McCann case, Metodo III specialised in investigating financial swindles, industrial espionage and insurance fraud. Money laundering was another of its areas of expertise. There is no evidence that Matodo III had any experience whatsoever in searching for, let alone finding, missing children, though they had made a completely false claim to have located 23 children. Toomey describes how her interview with Matodo III ended. When I ask Marco to elaborate on the 23 missing children he claims his agency has located in the past, Marco eases himself away from the table for the first time, tilting far back in his chair. He cannot talk about that on the grounds of confidentiality, he says. Shortly after this, his cousin José Louis, who has sat mostly silent until now, calls time on the interview with a chopping motion of his hand. It's clear that Matodo III had a very controversial history. One journalist who investigated them by visiting Barcelona spoke to the police and other reputable detective agencies there. All of them, without exception, described Matodo III as a disreputable, dodgy, rogue agency. One Spanish private investigator told the Daily Mail, Matodo III have portrayed themselves as the best investigators in the world. The truth is, they are nothing of the sort. Their murky background is riddled with controversy. Why would the McCanns choose the most disreputable private investigation agency going in Barcelona? Matodo III's boss, Francisco Marco, was described by leading Portuguese criminologist Mr. Moita Flores as a crook, and indeed last year Marco was arrested and charged with spying on a leading Spanish politician by illegally recording her private conversations in a restaurant. It caused a major scandal in Spain. Also arrested with him was his colleague Julian Perebenez, one of Matodo III's men most involved in the Madeleine McCann case. He soon admitted his guilt, having confessed to planting illegal bugging devices in the restaurant. When spotted by TV cameras walking side by side with the McCann team's private investigation head, Brian Kennedy and Pryde Luz, he was keen to avoid them. Many of the Matodo three detectives were once arrested in a phone-tapping scandal linked to leading politicians and businessmen. Five senior members of Matodo three, including Francisco Marco, were held in 1995 amid claims of industrial and political espionage, with Marco's mother, Martina Fernando Lado, 57, who founded the agency in 1985, being led away in handcuffs. She was arrested as she handed a client a cassette containing an allegedly illegally phone-tapped conversation. At the same time, police raided Matodo 3's Barcelona offices, seizing handguns, ammunition, listening equipment, cassettes and transcripts of illegally taped phone calls. Subsequently, Mrs. Lado was found to have made phone calls offering a telephone tapping service for a fee of around £20,000. 
Mrs. Lero's husband, Francisco Marco Poilo, and Marco's brother, Francisco Gabriel Fernandez Lado, were also arrested. Also, Sergio San Celestino, an employee of Spanish telephone company Telefonica, was suspected of illegal phone tapping and was proved to have close links with employees of Metodo 3. Amazingly, the prosecution of Metodo 3 was inexplicably dropped. None of them were convicted at that time for their alleged illegal phone tapping and firearms crimes. Not long after Christmas 2007, the McCann team nearly suffered another major embarrassment when their lead investigator on the Madeleine McCann case, Antonio Jimenez Raso, once described as Matodo III's detective in charge of special operations, was arrested on serious criminal charges. They only escaped embarrassment by some clever spinning of their chief public relations officer, Clarence Mitchell. Antonio Gimenez Razo was soon afterwards charged, along with his twin brother, with stealing 400 kilograms of cocaine, nearly half a ton, from an illegal shipment of 1,500 kilograms said to have been worth £25 million on a ship coming from Venezuela. He was also charged with breach of trust, misconduct in a public office, that is corruption, corruption of public officials and illicit criminal association. The alleged offence occurred in December 2004 and involved what a court was later to describe as an exceptionally violent and ruthless criminal gang involving at least 27 individuals. It emerged that Gimenez Rasso had until December 2004 worked as a chief inspector in the Drugs and Organised Crime Unit for the Barcelona Regional Police. He had left the police under mysterious circumstances just when an internal investigation was looking into how those 400 kilos of cocaine had disappeared. He then went to work for the controversial Matodo 3 detective agency in August 2005, joining the McCann's team's private investigation two years later. He spent the next four years in jail, remanded in custody. After a long process of investigation, during which the criminal gang tried various means, including making violent threats to the prosecutor to disrupt the matter coming to trial, and then tried to wreck the trial itself, Gimenez Razo was lucky to escape without punishment, as his active participation in the work of the gang could not be proved. But the judge admonished him sternly, telling him that as a former senior police officer, he had become far too close to the gang members. How deeply had Gimenez Razo this close associate of drugs lords and crime gangsters, been involved in working on the Madeleine McCann investigation? Very deeply. It has now become clear that an early suggestion of the McCanns was to suggest to the world that Madeleine had been stolen to order by a wealthy North African family and was probably in Morocco. The McCanns visited Morocco in June 2007 and promoted Madeleine's disappearance while they were there. A number of people visiting Morocco claimed to have seen Madeleine, but that was at a time when the media frenzy was at its height and Madeleine was being seen here, there and everywhere. Once Brian Kennedy was made the operational head of the McCanns' private investigation and he had appointed Gary Hagland as his liaison man with Matodo 3, the two men lost no time in working out a detailed plan which focused on promoting the notion that Madeleine was most likely in Morocco. Hagland was sent to London to discuss the Moroccan project with a former MI6 colleague who worked on the Foreign Office's Moroccan desk. A huge boost to what we might term the McCanns' Moroccan project came when there was a burst of media speculation in late September 2007 about whether a white girl being carried on the back of a Moroccan peasant woman could be Madeleine McCann. As it turned out, the girl, Bushra Bashina, was proved just days later to be a Moroccan girl being carried by her mother. How the photograph of her came to be taken, and how the McCanns came to get it before it got to the police, remains, like so much else, a deep mystery. It was clearly the McCann team who briefed the press and gave the media the photograph in question. Here is how Kate McCann explains it all in her book. On the 25th of September, we heard that a little blonde girl resembling Madeleine had been spotted with a group of Moroccan peasants. We received a photograph. She doesn't explain who took it, nor how it got to them. She goes on to say that the child looked too young to be Madeleine, adding that the picture was too grainy for us to be absolutely sure. The day the photograph appeared in all the British press, 25th of September, as Kate says, a contingent of the press pack jumped on planes to Morocco to try to track down Madeleine. She then explains that Brian Kennedy called us later that evening to ask if we would like him to fly out to Morocco to find out for certain. 
Kate says they were not sure this was necessary or wise. But she says off went Brian on his plane, his own private jet, to northern Morocco. It sounds as if this was just a spur-of-the-moment decision by a genuine man just wanting to do all he could to find Madeline. However, what Kate McCann appears to omit in her book is that this was no snap decision by Brian Kennedy. It seems he may have pre-arranged to meet Matodo 3's man in Morocco, Antonio Gimenez Razo. The plane flight to Morocco may have been arranged a week or two in advance. The publicity about Bushra Bashina simply appears to have coincided with his pre-planned visit. Antonio Jimenez Raso, a Spaniard, was the McCann team's main man in Morocco, also a Spanish-speaking country. This would enable him to work on the ground in Morocco and converse easily with those he wanted to speak to. The stated purpose of Jimenez Raso being based in Morocco that autumn was simply to find Madeleine. But let's now examine his actual actions. One of his key roles appears to have been simply to look for any witnesses who were prepared to say they might have seen Madeleine alive. There were reports that Gimeno Raso and other Matodo 3 detectives were going around Morocco offering ready cash to anybody who would say that they had seen Madeleine. This was dramatically confirmed by a newspaper report stating that the Moroccan government had taken the highly unusual step of expelling a man who had been visiting hotels and garages in various parts of Morocco, offering people money if they could claim to have seen a girl looking like Madeleine. The report did not name the man or his nationality, but it could well have been Gimenez Razo. After this, we suddenly find Antonio Gimenez Razo and his boss, Francisco Marco, turning up at the Portimao police station, which was the headquarters of the official investigation in Portugal. They were there to talk to the Portuguese police. This was on the 13th of November 2007, and with them for this most important meeting was the man directing the McCann's private investigation, Cheshire multimillionaire Brian Kennedy. So what was this meeting between the Portuguese police and the McCann's private detective all about? It had come about with the help of Gimenez Raso. He had used his various connections with the police in Barcelona to get the Barcelona police chief to ring his opposite number in Portugal and ask for a meeting. He said that Matodo III had vital evidence about who might have taken Madeleine. The meeting was duly arranged and Brian Kennedy jetted in from Cheshire to meet three Portuguese police officers. The Matodo three men had flown several hundred miles to attend this meeting. Kennedy flew some 1,500 miles. They must have considered it worth it. There, the three men wove elaborate and believable tales about three possible suspects. The Portuguese police took notes. They followed up what may have seemed promising leads to them. None of them came to anything. The only purpose they served, in fact, was to waste valuable police time. We have established then that Gimenez Raso spent four years in prison, remanded in custody for offences connected with his associations with members of a violent criminal gang. We have established that the McCann team not only employed him, but that he was the leading detective used by the McCanns. When Gimenez Raso was arrested in February 2008, the press immediately pointed out that he was one of the McCann's private detectives. How did the McCann team react? They denied it outright. Their spokesman Clarence Mitchell said, he is not one of our team. It was an outright outrageous lie, as we've just shown. That wasn't the only meeting that Brian Kennedy had that day, however. Let's have a quick look at the other meeting he had that evening. His meeting was at a villa near Praia de Luz called Sal Salito. It was at the home of Ralph and Sally Everley, the aunt and uncle of Robert Marat, the man who was made the first formal suspect over the reported disappearance of Madeleine back on the 15th of May that year. So in the distance there you can just see the property of Sal Salito. I'll just, I'll just point to it. This is it here. The Everlays property, Sal Salito. And this is the location that the Portuguese police searched in connection uh, with the Madeleine McCann disappearance. It was a high-powered meeting. Robert Murat was there, so was his high-powered lawyer, Francisco Pagaret. Brian Kennedy also brought his lawyer along the equally high-powered lawyer, Edward Smethurst. Smethurst had been for years Brian Kennedy's in-house lawyer for his Latin group business empire. He had also been appointed allegedly at a meeting on the 14th of September in London as the coordinating solicitor for Kate and Jerry McCann. In addition, he was a top Freemason. He is a senior Freemason in the East Lancashire Masonic province and is also called past worshipful master of his lodge.
Smethurst had been fully involved in the Masonic movement since his teens, after his father died suddenly in a mysterious fire. His mentor in the lodge was the former head of legal services at British Nuclear Fuels Limited, Alvin Shuttleworth. After he qualified as a lawyer, Smethurst was given the job of assistant legal officer by his mentor, Shuttleworth, where he soon became involved in defending compensation claims from leukemia victims in Cumbria who lived near the Sellafield nuclear site. In November 2007, Smethurst appeared in a panorama program on Madeleine's disappearance. It was quite clear when Kate and Joey came back to the UK that they were subject to an open season of, of abuse in the media. They'd obviously gone through the tragedy of having their daughter taken in very unfortunate circumstances. And to make matters infinitely worse, uh, we're now subject to a trial by media. So the main question we have to ask about this meeting is, what was it for? Here in the same room together, we had the first suspect, Robert Murat and his lawyer, Smethurst, the lawyer for the second and third suspects, the McCanns, and the McCanns team's head of their private investigation, Brian Kennedy. The meeting was kept secret, but leaked out in local Portuguese newspapers. Kennedy was asked why he had flown out all the way for a private meeting with the then chief suspect, Robert Murat. He replied, to offer him a job helping to find Madeline. You can judge for yourself how credible an explanation that was. But we must now move on to examine the role of Antonio Gimenez Raso and his boss, Francisco Marco, in another very bizarre and disturbing set of events. Some of you watching may remember, back in the winter of 2008, the scenes of a team of divers looking in a murky lake for Madeline's bones. At the very centre of this search for bones was another man we must now introduce. Also part of the Matodo 3 setup, a lawyer called Marcos Aragao Correa. He was a young lawyer in his early thirties who hailed from the island of Madeira. When the story first broke in late 2008, he presented himself as a good Samaritan type bloke who dipped into his own pocket to fund this search, based, he said, on information received. So what was this information received? He told an extraordinary story. Days after Madeline was reported missing, he said, what he referred to darkly as underworld sources had told him that Madeline had been abducted then raped, then killed, and then her body had been thrown in a murky lake. He said he had told Portuguese police about his information, but they had ignored him. He had then set about working out where this murky lake was, and, using clues received in a vision or a dream, he had got out some maps, toured the area, visited several lakes, and decided that Madeline's body must be in the Arada Dam. There was a tower by the side of the lake. He had reasoned that if, as he had been told, Madeline had been thrown in the lake, she must have been thrown in from the tower. Accordingly, he instructed his divers to search just the part of the lake that was near the tower. He, or others, had made sure the media and press were there to record the event, and Britain's mainstream media, as usual, lapped up and uncritically recycled the story as gospel. There was only one problem with the story. It was utter bilge. Total lies from start to finish. In the end, Marcos Correa was forced, under the pressure of relentless questioning from the media, to admit that he had told everybody a pack of lies. He said he would now tell the truth. The new story ran as follows. Two days after Madeline was reported missing, he went to his first ever spiritualist church meeting. He went home and then had a vision of a huge powerful man strangling a blonde girl about Madeline's age. Later, he says, he heard about the disappearance of Madeleine McCann and linked his vision with her disappearance, and that is how he became interested in her. Later, another vision of a murky lake came to him, and that, again, with the aid of maps, led him to the search of the Arada Dam. Unfortunately, for Marcos Correa's credibility, that story also crumbled under pressure, and he had to admit that that one was false as well. To return to the searches of the dam, there were two, one in late January and early February, and another week-long search in March. In each case, a team of British divers was used. Once again, Marcus Correa, under pressure, admitted that another part of his original story was also a lie.
He was not, in fact, a good Samaritan after all. He had been paid by Matodo III to carry out these searches of the dam. And, of course, Matodo III was being employed by Brian Kennedy on behalf of the McCann team. So in searching this dam, who was this man really working for? Quite plainly, he was working for the McCanns. And as most of the money for employing Matodo III was coming from the generosity of the British public, it was our donations that were funding this search. He first of all said that he had paid for these searches of the dam out of his own pocket. In the event there was much media coverage of both the searches. An item of clothing was found which it was said could be Madeleine's. It wasn't. Then a bag of bones was found which it was claimed could be Madeleine's. They were ostentatiously passed to the Portuguese police. They weren't Madeleine's bones. They were animal bones. Eventually the searches were called off. But now we come to a still more sinister part of this story. And that is that this search of the Arada Dam was planned at least seven weeks before it happened. As Marcus Correa later explained in a magazine article, he had met with Francisco Marco and Antonio Gimenez Rasso of Matodo III at this very Arada Dam on the 10th of December 2007. This may have been the very first time that Marcus Correa had been introduced to the two Matodo III investigators. They each had to travel a very long way. For Marco and Gimenez Rasso, the trip from their Barcelona base was 700 miles. From Marcos Correa's base on the island of Madeira, it was nearly 1,000 miles. Who was it arranged for this meeting? Correa, as we've seen, worked for Matodo III. We know that Francisco Marco and Gimenez Rasso from Matodo III were employed by Brian Kennedy from September 2007. Therefore, all three were Matodo III men, appointed by Brian Kennedy on behalf of the McCann team. Therefore, what appeared at first sight to be a genuine effort by a good Samaritan to check out information he had received that Madeline's body might have been thrown in the Arada Dam turns out instead to have been a meticulously planned event by Matodo III. And in funding this search, with the help of donations from the British public, they were relying, we now find out, on a man who lied through his teeth not once but twice about how he came to be interested in what really happened to Madeline. The more you peer into the events and people behind this search for bones in the Arada Dam, the more it has every appearance of being just a plain stunt designed to grab front page coverage in the British press. We have to ask, why did the McCanns do this? What was the whole purpose of this exercise? Why did three people employed by the McCanns travel a total of thousands of miles to meet at the dam in December 2007? And why, when news of the search broke in late January, were the British public not informed about the lead-up to this search? Before we leave the subject of Matodo III, I should just mention that its boss, Francisco Marco, was also involved at the same time as he had the Madeleine McCann contract in a major agricultural scam. This was exposed on the 2nd of February 2009. The case involved embezzlement and money laundering, that was hardly surprising, given Matodo III's record in involvement in money laundering. Basically, the Catalan regional government had commissioned and paid for a large number of expert reports. But these reports, said a state prosecutor, had no purpose or interest. One of the most blatant examples was the payment of Matodo III of nearly £30,000 for a wholly unnecessary socio-economic inquiry on hazelnut farming. The Clean Hands Collective, which campaigns against corruption, found out that the socialist agricultural adviser, Joaquim Lina, had asked Matodo III to carry out a hazelnut inquiry. But Matodo III's report was found to be merely a cut-and-paste job from an internet report on the hazelnut industry in a regional magazine, El Confidencial. In other words, Matodo III had got £30,000 for doing nothing of real value. In March 2008, the McCanns ceased using Matodo III full-time, but retained their services on a part-time basis. It's time now to look at the extraordinary person the McCanns and Brian Kennedy now put in charge of their search for missing Madeline. It was a company with the grand title of Oakley International. When news that Matodo III had been replaced leaked out in the press, the McCann spokesman Clarence Mitchell described them as the big boys of international private investigation. Once again, the British mainstream press simply reproduced this claim without bothering to look behind it. In fact, Oakley International was basically a one-man band run by an Irish fraudster and conman, Kevin Halligan. 
also involved with him was ex-MI5 friend Henry Exton. We would know very little about Halligan but for a penetrating article published on the 24th of August 2009 by security expert and writer Mark Hollingsworth in the Evening Standard. These were the main facts that he revealed. Brian Kennedy and the men he employed, such as Matodo 3 employees we've looked at, scared off witnesses, talking to them so aggressively that some of them later refused to talk to the police, wasted funds and raised false hopes. Brian Kennedy and his son Patrick had to be questioned by Portuguese police after attempting a rash 24-hour stakeout of a house where they thought Madeleine was being held. She wasn't being held there. The relationship between Matodo III and the Portuguese police then completely broke down. Kennedy's investigators had little experience of the required painstaking forensic detective work. In his article, Hollingsworth noted that Exton had once worked for MI5 but was sacked after being arrested, caught leaving a tax-free shopping area at Manchester Airport with a bottle of perfume he had not paid for. He accepted an official police caution. As for Kevin Halligan, Hollingsworth was damning. Halligan used a variety of names indeed when he met the McCanns, he told them his name was Richard Halligan. He falsely claimed to have worked for GCHQ and made other false claims and extravagant claims about himself. In 2006, the year before Madeleine went missing, he secured a contract with Dutch firm Trafigura. They had dumped toxic waste in a landfill site near Abidjan, the main city in Ivory Coast, causing severe physical illness to hundreds of people living nearby. The government had imprisoned some of Trafigura's executives. Trafigura appointed Halligan on a lucrative contract to help with negotiations to release its executives. He failed, meaning that Trafigura had to pay the eye-watering sum of around £125 million to secure the release of its executives. As Hollingsworth pointed out, Halligan made a fortune from Trafigura and was suddenly flying everywhere first class, staying at the Landsborough and Stafford Hotels in London and the Willard Hotel in Washington DC for months at a time. He then went on to describe what Halligan was doing when he was supposed to be working for the McCanns. He actually only worked for them for four months, as his six-month contract was terminated early. During this time, he was paid the sum of half a million pounds plus expenses. It was a daily rate of about £6,000 a day. On top of that, his first month's expenses claim was nearly £50,000. Yet he had absolutely no experience in tracing and finding missing people. During the Madeleine investigation, says Hollingsworth, Halligan spent vast amounts of time in the Hey Joe bar in the basement of the Abracadabra Club near his German Street office. Armed with a clutch of unregistered mobile phones and a Blackberry, the bar was in effect his office. He was there virtually the whole day. He had an amazing tolerance for alcohol. When not imbibing in St. James's, Halligan was in the United States. On the 15th of August 2008, at the height of the McCann investigation crisis, he persuaded Andrea Hollis, a former U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency official, to write out an $80,000 check to Oakley in return for a 10% shareholding. The money was then transferred into the private accounts of Halligan and his girlfriend, Shirin Trakitis, to finance a holiday in Italy. Halligan later faced a $6 million lawsuit in Virginia concerning an allegation that he repeatedly and systematically depleted funds from Oakley's bank accounts for inappropriate personal expenses. He faced a further £1.4 million damages claim from Mark Aspinall, a lawyer who had worked closely with him. He had invested half a million pounds with Halligan's Oakley International Company and lost the lot. Hollingsworth added that numerous employees, specialist consultants and contractors hired by Halligan had not been paid, adding that some of them now face financial ruin. Hollingsworth concluded his article by telling us that Halligan was now on the run from his numerous creditors and various law enforcers. It was in October 2009 that a sharp-eyed lady recognised Halligan's face from a photograph in the press. He had been spotted staying at the £700-a-night Oxford Hotel with his then-girlfriend. The police bundled him into a van and put him in Belmarsh Top Security Prison. He fought extradition for three years, finally being removed to the US, where he pleaded guilty to serious fraud offences. He served a total of four years in prison. Once again, we must ask, why did the McCann team turn to an out-and-out -out fraudster like Kevin Halligan? who had no ability or experience in tracing missing people. 
The McCann team had on board the McCanns themselves, both doctors, one of the country's most experienced PR experts, Clarence Mitchell, Brian Kennedy, a multi-millionaire businessman and his commercial lawyer, top Freemason Edward Smethurst. How could the McCanns spend well over half a million pound raised from the caring British public on this man? As one might expect, Kate McCann in her book glosses over this appalling episode, portraying themselves as naive. She wrote, the first and second phrases of the contract, April to July, ran fairly smoothly. Oakley had put in place systems to gather, collate, prioritise and follow up information coming in. There was little doubt at that stage progress was being made. But that simply wasn't true. Halligan achieved nothing. He did not take the investigation one jot closer to finding out who took Madeline and where she might be. And let's just have a look at these so-called systems that Halligan put in place for following up information coming in. One of these was Halligan's hiring of a company in Virginia in the US to follow up calls to the much trumpeted investigation hotline promoted by the McCanns. This was a telephone number published on the McCanns website, Find Madeline, which had the strap line, pick up the phone and bring Madeline home. Its director, Johan Selle, however, told the Mail on Sunday that neither the McCann team, nor Kevin Halligan, nor anyone else had followed up the single call made to the so-called hotline. This was what Daniel Boffey of the Mail on Sunday wrote. The headline ran, iJet director claims that the McCanns never followed up calls to their telephone hotline. Madeline McCann investigator didn't listen to any tip-offs given to hotline. He continued, Perhaps of most concern about Halligan is the lack of attention paid to the hundreds of phone calls received to the Madeline hotline. Halligan and Oakley International, based in Washington, failed to listen to a single call received on the hotline set up for potential informants by Kate and Jerry McCann last year. Johan Selle, the director of operations at iJet, revealed that for a year nobody even asked his company if they could listen to any of the calls received. He said his operators in Annapolis, Virginia had answered hundreds of calls but the information seemed wasted, possibly squandering valuable leads. He said we delivered Oakley a report with a summary of the calls and said if they wanted to come back they could listen to the recording. But nobody did. For someone with an understanding of the case it would be very easy for some to say that maybe 80 or 90 percent of the calls were hogwash but there may be a percentage where one would say maybe we should listen to this one or listen to that one. But our understanding is that this never took place. We are not sure whether Halligan provided our report to the family, or to the trust, or to those working for them, or to the teams working after him, because no one came back to us. We sent the report to the Oakley Group, and our assumption was that they were using it as a piece in the puzzle. But it appears that wasn't the case. The firm says it was not paid for its services by either Halligan or Oakley International. Time after time the McCanns begged the public to make that one phone call. Help us find the key that will unlock this puzzle. Help us find the missing piece of the jigsaw and so on. It seems from what Selle told the Mail on Sunday that the hotline was bogus. All you could ever do on the McCanns investigation line was leave a message. Nobody ever got an answer. That would be one thing, but Mr. Selle's evidence suggests that by the spring of 2008, the hotline was a complete sham. The Mail on Sunday article also gave further shocking particulars about what Kevin Halligan was actually doing whilst he was supposed to be looking for Madeline. Here is more from Daniel Boffey's article. Halligan squandered more than half a million pounds. In just one month, for example, he spent more than £3,000 just on dining out with his girlfriend. In fact, whilst supposedly working to find Madeline, he launched an extraordinary spending spree on hotels, restaurants and luxury goods. In his first two months as lead investigator in the search for Madeline, Halligan spent £7,000 on a personal chauffeur. Later, on a short trip to New York with a girlfriend, he lavished $1,600 on Salvatore Ferragamo leather goods, £5,500 on handbags, £500 on an Italian meal, £150 on a pair of designer glasses and £900 on a three-night stay at a five-star Renaissance hotel. Already the owner of a £1.5 million mansion, he also paid out during this time more than £50,000 on plumbing and mosaic tiling for his house in Great Falls, Virginia. He spoke of extravagant schemes he was developing to catch the abductor. One of the more bizarre claims was that he hired an actor to pretend to be a drunken priest. 
who would seek confessions as he toured the bars of Bride Luz, the resort where Madeline disappeared. He told others that a family with a Madeline look-alike daughter had been paid to set up home in a nearby resort in order to tempt out a potential kidnapper. There is no evidence that he did either of those things. Indeed, acquaintances describe him as a Walter Mitty character. After being pursued by creditors demanding to be paid for work done helping him, Halligan fled to Rome with Miss Trashitis. Almost immediately after arriving in Rome on their first class Lufthansa tickets, Halligan withdrew hundreds of thousands of pounds more from Oakley International's bank accounts, was seen drinking and spending prodigiously at the Hilton Cavalieri and Excelsior hotels in Rome before quietly slinking back to the UK a few months later. Halligan was a fraudster, conman and thief. He served four years for some of his frauds. The McCanns, Clarence Mitchell, Brian Kennedy and Edward Smethurst are all top-notch professional and business people. How can we possibly explain this high-powered group of professional people employing such a low-life fraudster for the task of looking for Madeline and the person who allegedly abducted her? It's a question which cries for a clear answer, but the McCanns have never given us that clear answer. We must therefore use our own gifts of inference to try and work out what was the real reason they employed him. We've looked so far at the first two phases of the McCann's private investigation. Phase 1, the employment of the most disreputable detective agency in Barcelona, Metodo 3, together with the employment in England of expert in money laundering and financial compliance, Gary Hagland. And Phase 2, their employment of Kevin Halligan, a serial conman and convicted fraudster. In Part 4, we'll conclude our probe into what really went on in the McCann's private investigations and conclude our series of films with an examination of the British government in assisting, at every opportunity, the McCanns to maintain their claim that Madeleine was abducted.